Uh, let's give it up for Sanjay. Cool. Thanks for having me. Uh, today my talk is called Fast and Reproducible Data Science. Um, so I haven't met a lot of you, so I wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Sanjay Sidanti. Um, I'm a senior software engineer at Carius. Uh, we're a startup using genomics um, and AI to improve infectious disease diagnostics. Um, and prior to working at Carius, I was at another uh, genomic diagnostic company called Council um, and another company in the healthcare space, uh, Flatiron Health. Um, I trained at Stanford, did my undergrad in CS, and a uh, master's degree in biomedical informatics. And it's kind of this hybrid background between uh, software engineering and informatics that brings me to this talk today, where um, for the past several years, I've worked on uh, both data science projects as, projects as well as uh, software engineering projects. And this talk is just... Um, some high-level recommendations after I've tried to bring software engineering best practices um, to, to the data science projects I've worked on. Um, so reproducibility in data science is a huge uh, topic right now if you haven't heard about it already. Um, whether it's machine learning or biology or whatever domain you are interested in, um, too often people publish really interesting data or really interesting results and then others are unable to replicate those results, even though it's based on um, open data. Um, and, and actually, most of the time, or, or very often, these projects are written in Python, uh, which has become the de facto language for, um, certainly for bioinformatics and, and really growing in popularity for data science in general. Um, and I think a lot of people have found that without proper tools, it can be really difficult to reproduce results of your own experiments, um, onboard team members onto your data science projects, or even test changes to your own code. Um, so this talk is sort of just some high-level recommendations about um, that I've learned over the years um, from working on these projects and from supporting data science and computational biology teams. Um, I want to make a disclaimer up front that um, nothing I'm about to tell you I would recommend for production. Um, this is all um, intended to next level your exploratory data analysis, um, but, but I wouldn't recommend a lot of these practices for production. Um, so the first tool I want to tell you about is Docker, which um, probably most of you know about already. Um, before Docker or, or even uh, virtual machines, um, I saw a lot of projects that were like the one on the left, where um, when you were trying to onboard someone on your team, there was probably a readme that said, um, go install these dependencies globally, maybe make a virtual environment, and um, use pip to install some Python dependencies, um, and then just kind of run the code, see what breaks, um, look at the error message, install whatever was missing, and rinse and repeat until the code eventually works. Um, and this was painful. Um, I, like, long ago, I saw some projects that took uh, multiple days to, to onboard new team members for. Um, and with Docker, um, if you invest in writing a Docker file, it really becomes a lot simpler. Uh, you basically just build the image, and, and hopefully you should be able to run it right away if you did everything right. Um, another scenario this is relevant for is um, I actually worked on a project in the past where um, there was a whole bunch of bespoke setup um, on in-house hardware. And when the company needed to uh, move to the cloud, uh, they weren't sure if it was possible or, or how to replicate the environment that was um, being used, because it had all sorts of depend dependencies scattered over the machine, NFS mounts, um, tons of stuff. Um, so again, um, Docker is not magic, but um, it's a small investment you can make to um, at least uh, not be tied to certain hardware um, and, and hopefully make it much easier to bring on new people. Um, <clears throat> when people get started with Docker, they often complain that it makes them slower. Um, and that can be due to a variety of factors. Uh, but the one I want to focus on here is a really high level overview of um, how to get your Docker um, image builds a little bit faster. Um, 
So kind of like a 30 second intro to how Docker does build caching. So when you write a Docker file, each command creates a new layer. And when Docker is building your image, um, it looks for, um, if, if you're already um, in the cache thus far, it looks at the next instruction and sees if there's a layer that was built with that exact same instruction. Um, if so, it uses it and you stay within the cache. Otherwise, um, the cache is invalidated and you um, have to run all of the remaining instructions um, without using a cache. Uh, it's worth noting that for add and copy, um, those are two instructions where you're actually putting data inside your image. Um, it doesn't just check the, the string of the instruction, but rather it uh, does a checksum of the file contents uh, to see if the data actually changed. Um, so again, uh, that doesn't do justice to, to um, Docker internals, but I tried to give just enough content um, to give a recommendation, which is that when you're writing a Docker file, I recommend you order it from the least often changed uh, instructions at the beginning to the most frequently changed things at the end. Um, that way, when, when you're changing something that is frequently changed, at least it's at the very end, you get to stay within the cache all the way up until that last instruction. Um, and and um, this advice is really as simple as reordering the lines that already exist in your Docker file, but it can actually be a game changer uh, depending on how you have it structured right now. Uh, the second tool I want to talk about is how to get source code inside a Docker container. Um, so there are kind of two main strategies for doing this. One is to uh, build your source code into the Docker image, and the other is to mount your code into the container at runtime. Um, so when you build your code into the image, typically you're using um, add or copy, which are Docker instructions, or something like git, git clone. Um, and then when you edit your code, uh, you have to rebuild the image uh, before you can um, test out your improvements. Um, this might seem like a small thing, but when you're making dozens of changes a day on a model, um, these like you know two minutes at a time can really add up into hours. Um, and also for me, just the 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 pain of waiting and context switching um, can really add up. So how I recommend you do this again, uh, only for local development. Don't do this for production. Is um, I recommend that you mount your source code into the container as a data volume. Um, then you can edit code locally in your text editor or your IDE, whatever you want, um, and immediately rerun. Uh, you don't have to rebuild the image. You can just rerun it right away. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is that it's really important to track and version your data dependencies. So um, the reason for this is it's kind of useless to have a really nice model if you can't find the data that you use um, to to do the analysis. Um, I recommend Git LFS, uh, that's uh, large file storage, I think, or just Amazon S3, depending on your needs. Um, Git LFS is OK if um, you don't want to introduce a new tool. You just want to stay within Git. Um, it works by replacing large files with pointers. Um, and then it actually stores the file contents on a remote server, and you can pull uh, you can fetch uh, certain files when you need them. Um, but I found it to be kind of clunky to work with, just in my experience, um, and a little bit hard to control. Um, so if you're fluent with AWS, or if you already have that as part of your stack, um, I've had a really good experience using S3 to um, track and version um, my data dependencies, uh, basically no matter how large they are. Um, one other option that I haven't tried is Git Annex. Uh, it looks interesting, so if anyone has tried it, I'd be interested in hearing about it after this. Um, the fourth tool I want to talk about is uh, managing your numerical dependencies. So um, I think a lot of people don't realize this because it's pretty subtle, but when you upgrade a, li a library like NumPy, um, due to uh, changes in their internal implementations, you can actually get different results um, for your floating point arithmetic. Um, Usually, these are going to be small changes, but this can be a problem if you come back to a project six months later. You know you use NumPy, so you just do a pip install NumPy, and all of a sudden, you start getting back different data, different results than you did the first time. Um, 
And so I strongly recommend that you use some sort of tool to record exactly which versions of these libraries you're using. Um, it probably doesn't matter so much for things like Matplotlib, but certainly for NumPy, Pandas, uh, things of that nature. Um, you could use pip uh, with like pip freeze, or you could use pip end, really whatever you want, just to make sure you have a record of, um, of what versions you were using during your analysis. Yep. You know, I understand why it would be nice the same answer you got a month ago. Yeah. But which one should you be trusting? The one from six months ago or the one right now? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I think that, so this doesn't exactly answer the question, but I think that it's hard to trust either if you can't reproduce them. Um, so, so it's not like the first one or the second one is strictly better but um, it's more that you have confidence in your process and that uh, nothing else changed. You, you know that the input data didn't change or something weird like that. If you can at least reproduce the same results with the same version of NumPy and, and then you can upgrade if you want and, and compare the differences. So but you just heard implication that NumPy is not trustworthy then? No, I wouldn't say that. I don't know, does anyone else have thoughts? Um, yeah, I, go ahead. Well, no, I mean, I think that you're right, is that like you want it to happen uh, explicitly. Right? Yeah. It's not the first one's better than the second one's better. It's just that you want to like do that on purpose. You know? well, I understand. I started that with a question. Right, right. But then, I understand why you want to say it. Well, and, and NumPy needs to be able to be free to do the upgrades too. A lot of times those uh, those answers are like, you know, consistent within themselves and they come faster, right? They have a lot of performance optimization. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I trust NumPy to do the right thing. Uh, I think most people do that by we use it. But, uh, yeah, you just, you just don't want it changing up from under you on accident. Can you agree? Uh, is there anything you can do to comment to the future? There's a lot of people who test NumPy and not, not design a version, so they can upgrade this to do it. Who wants to be a version that you have tested on? So that's the only changes to upstream to see if you think that or at least stay within the minor version, batch version. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. We'll take the rest, we'll take the rest after. Okay, sure, either way. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's like a more philosophical question and I wasn't prepared with that answer, but uh, we should talk after. Um, I finished that? Yeah, okay. Um, the last tool, I think I'm almost out of time. The last tool I wanted to talk about was Jupyter. Um, I'm really glad I got to see Maya's talk where she actually presented it in a Jupyter notebook. That was awesome. Um, and I didn't feel like I could give a talk about data science workflows without mentioning Jupyter. Um, it's just made it so much easier to share and collaborate um, on data science projects. Um, I run it within Docker and it works really well. Um, and it's kind of a unique way where you can unify code data and analysis in one place. As you saw with Maya's notebook, there, was, um, there were the, the plots that were there in line, the actual code that any, any one of us could run to reproduce those plots as well as um, the data. Um, and, and of course, if you're using Python, um, because you have IPython in a notebook, um, you can do more of the time consuming things like cleaning and formatting data once and then uh, have it available as long as your notebook is running. Um, okay, yeah, so I wanted to keep this short. I think it was a 15 minute talk. Um, so, so far in this talk, I, um, I discussed mostly workflows for reproducibility and, um, and testing things quickly. Um, in some other talk, uh, just as a teaser, I'd be really interested in diving into actually how to um, optimize and distribute the numerical code that you're using in uh, Python data science projects. And um, so these are some of the uh, projects that you may have heard of. Um, particularly the second line is really interesting to me where there are a lot of these projects coming out right now that implement the Pandas API on top of Spark or on top of Ray. Um, and uh, at least all of them show that they are much faster than pandas, but I haven't seen like necessarily a great head-to-head-to-head -to -head -to -head comparison. Um, and I think one tricky part with a lot of these projects is 
Um, they work really well for large data on many machines, but will they also work for your little test data running on your MacBook? Um, or are they going to take three minutes because they have all this infrastructure that's supposed to spin up a cluster and distribute stuff? Um, so uh, this is something that I'm interested in uh, uh, working more with in the future. So if anyone has thoughts, uh, let me know after this. And yeah, other than that, thank you for uh, thank you for listening, and let me know if you have any questions.